Magicians have been around since forever because human beings have always wondered, how do we take this power and make it that power? And how much power can I control? How can I control all this power? How can I dominate it? How can I maneuver it? Is there a way to take lead and turn it into gold? Is there a way to cast spells? Hi, everybody. Time for a new archetype. Uh, this week, I'm doing The Magician. And I thought that would be fun because um, everybody likes a little magic. And that's where we're going to start. What is the seductive power of the magician in our world? And it is totally seductive. What is it about magic that mesmerizes people? What is that thing in us, that mechanism that makes us wish, want, watch movies where someone can transform something from this to that in the blink of an eye? just like that. What is magic? What is magic? And um, I'm going to start from a very ordinary perspective, but it's not. It's a perspective really of life. What are we doing here? <laughs> really? What are we doing here? Your life, everything you do, every choice you make is an act of transformation. You're transforming, transforming something from this to that. Whether you look at something in your kitchen, like I'm going to take this, these vegetables and turn it into a pasta sauce or whatever, that's an act of transformation. It's an obvious one. But it's not as obvious. When you are working at a more elevated, sophisticated level of energy and you make a choice in, your, in, in yourself to transform the power of a negative attitude to a positive one. And that kind of psycho-spiritual alchemy happens. And you don't perhaps see an immediate consequence of it. But in fact, it's an act of alchemy, spiritual alchemy. And you begin immediately to transform the energy with which you are breathing into breathing into the laws of the universe, your relationship with cause and effect and action and reaction and, and thought into form. You don't realize in that moment that you've changed your universe. You've changed your universe. Consider going from a thought, I'm a bad person to, no, I'm not. I'm a, I think I'm actually a good person. A handful of words. And yet, a complete transformation undergoes in your neurology, in your biology, and in the extended biospiritual ecology of your life. My point here is that from the get-go, we are involved in constantly transforming energy to matter, matter to energy. That's all we do here. That's all life is. It, it's, we, all life is, is becoming aware that that's what we do here. And that there are choices that have more power than others, that reap a better, a better harvest than other choices. That in fact, our choices blend together. So we're all in this together. We, we simply don't get the mathematics of the all in it together um, level of calculus, but that's what's true. Just like one cell in your body is functions as they all do. We're all in it together. They're all in it together. But if you take one cell out and say, hey, listen, what happens in you happens in the whole of me. So let's stay healthy. That cell may look at you and say, what are you kidding? I've got my own little cell universe here, but they don't. None of us has our own universe except in the world behind our eye. Magicians have been around since forever because human beings have always wondered, how do we take this power and make it that power? And how much power can I control? 
How can I control all this power? How can I dominate it? How can I maneuver it? Is there a way to take lead and turn it into gold? Is there a way to cast spells? Is there a way, spell casting, which is to take our tools of consciousness and hack into the consciousness of other people, make them do things. All of this, we can't, people can't stop wondering, how do we use this power? How do we control this power? And I can only think, really, that heaven must watch us with such a whimsical, farcical viewpoint that we think we have, we, that there's something we can do in these little bodies of ours that can control all this power that is the universe. It's so ridiculous, but nevertheless, the magician. Now, classically, of course, we think of magicians as wizards and, and they go all the way, way back. You know, Jesus was even accused of being a magician and, you know, because he, because of his miracles and um, razzle dazzling people. Um, so he was even accused of being a magician. But of course, I think one of the most famous magicians is Merlin and how oftentimes uh, leaders, kings, um, people in power will want people who have access to occult power to be near them. That's not uncommon. Hitler did that. It's not uncommon at all that they will somehow, I mean, Reagan had astrologers, you know, they, they want access to a kind of a power that is hidden behind the ordinary eye. Now, <clears throat> magic essentially is the capacity to learn the laws of the universe, the mystical laws, the laws of science, and then the mystical laws and combine them. And then think that there are some kinds of ways to use your consciousness to maneuver the laws of the universe, to act in ways on your behalf. Now, I'm just going to hit a pause button here and introduce something that actually might seem like a curveball in this subject, but it's not. What's a miracle? What is a miracle? You know, a miracle is an experience that the best way to, to describe it, I think, came from a nun that I knew, Sister Kevin, who said that a miracle is when God decides to bend the laws of the universe just for you. That something that ordinary mortals considered an anomaly, you know, that can't possibly happen, makes an event happen out of the sequence of conventional time and space. You heal in a second, as opposed to not being able to heal at all, or maybe it would take five years, but in fact, it took a blink of an eye. That's the speed at which Jesus healed. And truly, truly, if this was a class in the laws of the universe and the way consciousness works with it and how if, as you become more conscious, your relationship with law and consciousness and the speed at which you comprehend things, the speed at which you comprehend it, the speed at which the laws work because you comprehend something faster, it shifts. It shifts. This is a whole different discussion. I don't want to open that door, but, but <clears throat> what Jesus was saying is what I'm doing, you can do because I'm dealing with law. I'm dealing with law. I'm not dealing with magic. I'm dealing with law. So bring it down a level. Magicians are people who are dealing with, in, in the uh, true magic sense, they're trying to maneuver laws. And, you know, in, in the uh, mythic days, in the days of, you know, spell casting, in the days of Merlin, Merlin came to get Arthur as a boy so he could raise him and teach him and school him in the magic of the Druids. And 
Um, interesting story. Ju- Julius Caesar was fascinated with the Druids because he had to battle the um, Celts in, in what is now France, in Gaul. And he was fascinated because he saw that and he, he had a Druid brought to him a wizard. And he said, what is it you tell those trees that they don't, when my, when my Praetorian guards go into the forest, they get lost, they get confused. What are you, what spells are you casting on them? He also noticed that the wizards, the druid wizards would go into the battlefield ahead of time before a battle and they would summon the power of the trees to go ahead of them. And he also noticed that they had a wand and the wand was always made from oak, not from cedar, not from walnut, but from oak. These are fascinating observations. He wanted to know what knowledge that was. So a characteristic of the magician archetype is access to secret knowledge that has some kind of authority over the world of matter that is hidden from ordinary mortals who have not earned that right to the knowledge of the mystery schools. Okay. And Merlin, of course, was this magician guardian to Arthur and, and, um, and would protect him with spells. In an exaggerated way, you know, Merlin could become an owl or do whatever he wanted. But this is like in our fantasy world about power. Could we transform ourselves from one shape to another? The fantasies we have about the capacity to become invisible, to to become other than the way we are, but at its root... These fantasies are rooted in this sense that we have the conscious, that something in our consciousness is powerful enough to transform matter and energy, that we are somehow constantly in the laboratory of transformation. Now, Obviously, when you think of magicians, you know, uh, there's, there's, you know, Harry Potter and, and all of the, the, the school of magic um, that was, you know, one of the most popular, popular uh, book and, and movie series ever made. And while so, I mean, J.K. Rowling is brilliant with her capacity to capture the imagination of a school of magic, a school of magic. And then there was a book that came out roughly about the same time, and it didn't reach the acclaim uh, because it's not quite as childlike enchanting, but it's enchanting nonetheless, and it's called Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. And I don't know if how many of you have read that, but I read it. And the, the, what, the interesting thing in this story is it's about a group of magicians living in London, um, roughly around the late 1800s. And they don't practice magic because they've decided that because they are so good, they no longer need to practice magic. And actually, they're frauds, right? And then they hear about this Mr. Norrell who comes to town, who is supposedly is this incredible magician. And they want to put him in his place, so they offer him a challenge, thinking that he'll back down and that will just prove that he's just not a magician. But he accepts it, and he tells them to meet him at St. Paul's Cathedral at midnight on this one day, so they all gather. They have no idea what's going to happen. So they're sitting in the church, and at midnight, all of a sudden, all the statuary becomes animated. And all these concrete statues that have been standing next to each other for hundreds of years wake up, statues of bishops and priests and whatever, and they start screaming at each other, I've never liked you, blah, 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 blah. But. He, he could cast this spell. <clears throat> and this spell is always about the capacity of a human being to have authority over the matter-based world. 
and of course dark magic, black magic, to cast spells over human beings um, to control them. And of course, at its root, the magician is about control. The magician is about the, having the capacity, a secret capacity, to control something that other people can't control because of a secret knowledge of the occult or mystical laws. It's mystical laws. It's the invisible science. There's the physical science, the laws of chemistry and this and that. And then there's the invisible laws, the invisible science, which is an absolute reflection. Remember, as above, so below. So the laws are identical, but they're conscious in the mystical realm. They're, they work within us. They work through us. They're in our blood, our bones, and our consciousness, which is why every choice you make is an act of creation. Now, um, you would think, you know, when you think of magicians, I'm sure you think of the classic people today who like maybe do magic acts or study magic, but actually, actually, this is the way archetypes can, you know, they maneuver in our lives and they don't necessarily look like the, you know, poster child for magic. Like a like a Merlin or a Dumbledore, isn't that his name? Dumbledore, Dumbledore. Um, I had a conversation with someone in, in, a, in a workshop. This was quite some time ago, and he was a um, pharmacologist, and he was telling me about his research to find this particular type of mechanism, drug mechanism that did something within our body chemically and blah blah blah, and it was fascinating. I can't recall it all, so I'm not going to screw it up. Um, but the point is, he was he was a wizard alchemist, magician. He was looking for the mechanism that would allow a change to happen in his laboratory because he knew there had to be some formula, some way to facilitate the fact that something in our biochemistry, our neurochemistry, could be facilitated with something. This is a form of, of, it's not what you would call classic magic, but you would call it wizardry. Pharmacology, pharmacological wizardry. This is an aspect of it. This is that search to work in a laboratory, to work with the chemical and physiological ingredients in a laboratory to find formulas that transform this to that. I have often referred to my dear and forever friend and partner, uh, medical partner, Norm Sheely, as a wizard. Because I deeply, deeply believe that he is that. And for all the many years I've known him, and I've known him since uh, 82 or 83, Norm is compelled to do research, which he's still doing now in his 90s, on how to take, for example, years ago, pain and what possible, possible um, ways could he find alternatives from medication to take the state of pain and take a person from one level of consciousness to another. That too was wizardry. And he was willing to try anything. He was willing to try creating uh, crystal beds and, and utilizing all of these other things in nature had to offer, thinking if he could activate the powers in a crystal along with the power in a person and along with hypnosis and along with anything, he was willing to turn a human being into a human laboratory to activate a level of consciousness within a person organically, naturally, anything to avoid chemicals. So he could access what you would think of as energetic medicine. Energetic medicine. That's the wizard. That's the, the magician, the sacred magician wizard in it, taking and using the laws and utilizing them. But the thing is, the laws of consciousness require your consciousness to be animated. If you look at the scripture, 
And I really do recommend you go back and read the stories of the healings with Jesus. He activated in people, he activated their consciousness before healing. He would say, your faith has healed you. He would activate something in them so that their consciousness was a participant within the dynamic of healing. It wasn't, he just didn't randomly, you know, like go through, go through um, the crowds and just say, you're healed, you're healed, you're healed. No, no. It was a conscious act that included engaging the consciousness of another person because the laws are conscious. It, it's so obvious when you see it. It's so obvious when you see it that you get how you are a conscious participant, a conscious participant. You know, I think there are many ways that the, the magician can, um, the shadow magician can engage the spellcaster, can engage the, the, the dynamic of casting spells upon other people because you know we're so willing we're so willing to want to believe in something greater than ourselves and we don't have <clears throat> a real mechanism in you discernment the grace of discernment when you don't have that kind of clear what's real what's not you can be razzle dazzled by what you see another person do. And you can think that that's quite amazing. And the next thing you know, like and it's, it's no different than advertisers who cast spells and say, if you take this pill, your whole body will be different. It's magic. You just take this pill and in 20 seconds, 20 days, you're gonna look 45 years younger and Etc., etc., and you'll be happy and you'll be able to fly, and all this nonsense people tell advertisers tell people. I mean, I'm watching these commercials on this uh, that are constantly on when in the morning when I watch the news about <clears throat> this new vitamin product, and you see all these people mountain climbing, skiing, this, that, and the other, all because they take these little capsules. I, I it is out that to me is spellcasting magic. It's absolute nonsense. But this is how it works. That's, the, that's that part of us that thinks, can I transform energy into the matter that I want faster than my own consciousness is capable of doing it? I could get to this place. I could become healthier on my own steam by eating more consciously, by working out, by doing things more consciously. But I don't have the energy. Can I get it out of a bottle? Can I get a spell? Can I get a little magic here? <clears throat> and so we look at these people that look like magicians, like they've come up with a magical formula. And we buy it. And I've been in people's homes. They have shelves of these magical formulas that they took for two, three, five five days and then oh well the magic the spell wears off and that's the thing about inauthentic magic the spell wears off the spell casting well we'll get you know what maybe I'll do something on the spell caster next because it, it would be a natural follow-up to the magician and the spell caster because <clears throat> there is something in us that inner part of us that knows this universe is run by invisible law. We know that. This is not a religious teaching. You're born knowing that. You know that. Your conscience is geared to that. So you know that. And so that's why you hesitate to make choices, to, 
to actually set power into motion because you know you're setting power into motion, which is why someone says, make it just, I don't know, gee, I don't know, gee, I don't know, because you know it's a profound act of creation. People that take months to make a decision, well, you just make a decision, well, I don't want to, well, I don't know, I'll be held responsible for what happens. The magician is someone who actually thinks they can maneuver these laws in a way that is different, more spectacular, secret, more that they can own the laws as opposed to be governed by them. And if you're doing it for fun, like you go to Las Vegas and you see these fantastic but fantastic magicians doing stunts on stage. That's fun. That's fun. And for a moment, you're absolutely in awe. How did they do that? I went to a place in Los Angeles called the Magic Castle. And it was one of the most enjoyable evenings of my life. And all these professional magicians were performing in different rooms. And, and I was sitting right in front of one of them. And he had, he had a ball in his hand. And he threw it. It looked like it was coming right toward my face. And then it vanished. I, was, I still can't figure out how he did that. I still can't. That's fun magic. That's just fun. But there was no spell cast. There was no, I have no idea how he did that. I still can't. I, I have no idea how these people do that, but that's fun. That's that fun, enjoyable, incredible level of magic. I have a dear magician friend named Mickey Magic who did all kinds of sleight of hand tricks, and, and, and that's enchanting. But as I say, this idea that any person can dominate the laws as soon as that becomes a, a you, you start spilling into the world of alchemy and wizards and um, thinking you can spell cast, you're in trouble. But the magician is also kind of present in the psychic field of those, in the psychic patterning of those who pursue life in a laboratory, trying to find ways to make this do that on behalf of people, and, and, or, or find ways to create and invent what hasn't been done before. Because this world is always talking to us and always saying there are ways to create things that you have not thought about. This world is an endless creative way. There are solutions to what you think of as dilemmas that you haven't even thought of because of the way you think is so limited. Think big, think huge, think out of the box, go higher. Think on behalf of others <clears throat> and you'll get a solution on behalf of others. That's how the universe works, taking this and putting it into that. And those people who are driven by that have a magician in them, have this idea of having their, they have an inner laboratory, they have a wizard in them, they have their, like Norm, they're, they're driven to make life better for others. So I, I don't know how many of you have elements of a magician in you. I think the magicians show up with great chefs. Great chefs have magicians that can take what look like ordinary food, ordinary vegetables, ordinary beans and rice, and suddenly turn it into a feast. That's a magician trick. That's like, how'd you do this? Where'd you get this? What was in your refrigerator? I have a friend named Georgia. She could do this. She opens up my, my refrigerator. I see nothing. She sees dinner. I mean, to me, that's a magician. That's a culinary magician. So magicians show up in people in all kinds of delicious ways. They can take what looks ordinary to us and transform it as if out of the clear blue into something we never saw because they think in ways that are not limited by the form something came in by the form. It's not an ordinary vegetable. It could be anything. It could be anything. 
I just have to transform it. I just have to work a little magic. So I'm going to leave you with this idea that you could work a little magic in your life in, in all kinds of ways. Think out of the box. Work a little magic. Think, what else could this be? What if I didn't think conventionally? What could it look like? What could I do? If you look at a room and think, I got to work a little magic in here. I got to make this room spectacular. It looks so ordinary. I got to make this situation spectacular. It looks so ordinary. Every one of us can tap into the mag magician. And, and, and it, that's fun. That's delightful. You know, think about arranging flowers and things. Instead of just sticking them in a put some magic in it. Well, maybe if I did a little of this and I did a little greens, a little that, it's going to look magical. Everybody has enchantment in them. Everybody. And bring that into your life. Bring it into your life with a little effort. With a little effort. Transformation is everything. It's everything. Okay, everybody. See you next week.